Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at 28 Days Later, a British film released in 2002. 28 Days Later is a benchmark horror film that perfectly captured the post-9-11 zeitgeist and changed the zombie subgenre forever. Filled to the brim with standout settings and memorable sequences, this movie features a remarkable amount of talent. Its cast has a couple of actors who were known at the time but still had huge roles ahead of them, and other actors who were just starting their their careers and would go on to find huge success. The people behind the camera were just as impressive, too. This was Alex Garland's first screenplay after having made a name for himself with his 1996 novel The Beach. Garland would wind up writing and directing films like Ex Machina, Annihilation, and Men. Directing Garland's script here was Danny Boyle, who had already done Train Spotting and an adaptation of The Beach. Boyle would go on to direct Oscar nominated movies like Slumdog Millionaire, 127 Hours, and Steve Jobs. 28 days later follows a small group of survivors in a post-apocalyptic Britain. The country's been devastated by the rage virus, a highly contagious sickness that turns people into murderous maniacs. It's so lethal, society has crumbled a mere four weeks after the first exposure, thus the title. These hordes of mindless killers aren't technically dead, or undead for that matter. But 28 Days Later is a zombie movie in spirit. Screenwriter Garland was initially inspired by the Resident Evil games after all, though he did base the rage infection on real-world diseases like a recent foot and mouth outbreak. It resulted in the slaughter of over 5 million animals. That's more than the entire human population of Liverpool. The rage virus also borrows symptoms of Ebola and the animal-to-human transmission of HIV and mad cow disease. Maybe that's why director Boyle didn't think of this as a zombie movie at all. He called it a reflection on social rage. Still, the film's three acts are basically a speedrun of the Romero trilogy. The first is centered around fighting for survival and learning about the new reality, just like Night of the Living Dead. The middle of the film follows a makeshift family settling in and occasionally having fun, just like what we saw in Dawn. And the final act involves a small military unit who's trying to keep things under control, just like in the underrated Day of the Dead. Though inspired by Romero's films, 28 Days Later keeps itself fresh with well-acted characters and, of course, the element of speed. Again, these aren't technically zombies since the infected folk are all still alive. But it's no coincidence that after this movie, cinematic zombies picked up the pace, most notably with the 2004 Dawn of the Dead remake. 28 Days Later also feels like the purest distillation of the post-9-11 era, even though Though it was written and began production before September 11th. Most of the film is shot on low-resolution DV, using Canon XL1 digital video cameras instead of traditional film. This is the way we record our lives. We are surrounded in this city. By cameras. It was one of the first big films to be shot digitally, which provided both opportunities and challenges for production. The biggest impact, though, is how the film looks. This movie feels like you're watching it on a duplicated VHS. It feels like if I returned it to Blockbuster late, I'd wind up dead in seven days. It makes the movie unbelievably eerie, like the original Evil Dead, which looks so grainy and homespun it feels like a snuff film. This is the digital equivalent of that, which is perfect for the nihilistic early 2000s when the internet was still primitive. Entertainment was shit like that Colin Powell Banana Boat spoof, watched on a 56k connection. 28 Days Later immediately transports you back to that time. And I love it when a movie captures the essence of an era well. And you can trust me on this one. I remember that era well. <laughs> oh, hey man, you coming over later? We're gonna warthog jump to a secret spot in Blood Gulch. <laughs> good times. Of course, I didn't realize how much I was missing out back then since I didn't have today's sponsor, Raycon. Ray what? Raycons, you stupid memory child. They make wireless everyday earbuds, low latency gaming headphones, and speakers with batteries to last all night. Audiences know I love my earbuds, thanks not just to their sound quality, but also their eight hours of playtime, their custom gel tips for perfect in-ear fit, and the ability to choose between noise isolation or awareness mode while listening. Ah, oh, sick, dude. I can't wait to use those with my portable CD player while I'm grinding rails. <laughs> Uh, come on, bud. We both know that skateboard's just for show. What? No, dude. I can totally ollie, almost. Try getting into fitness, bud. That's how I like to use my earbuds. And hey, in a couple of decades, you can get yourself your own Raycons at about half the price of other premium audio brands. And you can check out Raycon 2 by going to the link in the description or going to buyraycon.com slash deadmeat to get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Nice guy, that 2000s me. Nope, that's a lie. He was a total asshole. Will a bunch of pseudo zombies give us a real zombie movie body count? Let's find out and get to the kills. 
The movie begins with animal cruelty, a monkey being forced to watch cable news. Eco-terrorists break into primate Jigsaw's lair to liberate chimp kind from the outrage feedback loop. A scientist tries to stop him, saying the monkey's blood is infected with a super contagious virus. Infected with what? Right. <laughs> Just like that, the movie sets up the stakes and gets some commentary in. If you sit around all day watching outrage porn, it'll turn you into a rage-fueled wild animal, just like this little guy. Before anyone can say nope, the chimp goes full Gordy on an activist, who then activates rage mode and spreads it by spitting in another guy's eyes. When the scientist tries to intervene with a steel stool, he's attacked and killed off screen while his chimpan prisoners watch from their cages. Title card! Days later, a bike messenger named Jim wakes up from his coma in an abandoned hospital. Yeah, remember The Walking Dead? This movie did it first, and with way more dong. That dong belongs to Irish actor Killian Murphy, last seen on the kill count and using warp pipes in A Quiet Place 2. When director Danny Boyle cast him, he was a 25-year-old at the beginning of his career. He'd go on to do many great things, including Wes Craven's Red Eye. That movie rules. Jim replenishes a month's worth of lost nutrients with a lukewarm Pepsi before venturing out into the world and discovering an empty dystopia. There are no fair ladies on London Bridge, and not a single American werewolf to be found. His sightseeing tour of an eerily empty London, set beautifully to Godspeed You Black Emperor's song East Hastings, is the film's most iconic sequence, selling the scale of the infection in just a few shots. Not that they were easy to capture. What we try to do is try and find kind of iconic images that again did the work of a huge, huge budget. To get shots of these popular places without any people in them, production only had a week of one hour windows to shoot in, usually starting around three or four in the morning. Thankfully, shooting with video cameras allowed them to work quickly. The police were quite happy to assist us in the councils, to assist us doing it because we could do it so quickly to be ready to shoot in literally minutes. To capture this overturned double-decker bus, they had to place the bus on its side, get the shot, and remove the bus all within 20 minutes. When he finally gives up on finding the Sunday funnies, Jim makes his way to a church with edgy graffiti and a mosh pit. Oh, wait, that's a bunch of dead bodies. Fuck, this is gonna be one of those? I've never worked at anything like that where there's such a massive body count. <sighs> it's gonna be one of those. There are 78 corpses here, by writer Jeremy's count. Production couldn't afford to hire that many extras to play dead bodies, so these are actually local college students paid in tea. <laughs> Friends. The scariest part about all these dead bodies is when Jim finds out not all of them are dead. Hello? An infected priest stumbles in, speaking in tongues and or choking on bile. Jim sees the light of the danger he's in and cures the father's cold with a prescription from Dr. Pepper. Jim runs like hell and can thank his lucky prayers that the Lord works in mysterious ways, like Molotov cocktails tossed by strangers. The divine immolation cremates one zombie. Eventually, I mean. These infected don't really mind for a while. The other two infected carry on extra crispy, so Jim's rescuers go for the mother of all double taps by hiding behind a wall as a gas station explodes incinerating the other two infected. It's a speck of spectacle against the barren cityscape, one of my favorites of this movie's many awesome shots. This practical explosion was filmed from 4 to 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning and required production to clear 20 blocks and hold back 30,000 Londoners. The gas station was built from scratch in an old World War II bomb factory and brought real fire trucks to the scene since production forgot to give the local police department a heads up. Fucking whoops. Jim's new pyro pals lead him down the tubes to their secret clubhouse, where they regale him with snacks and dad jokes. The comedically inclined man is Mark, while his much more stoic, non-romantic partner is Selena. She's played by Naomi Harris, who was also at the start of her career, before going on to act in a bunch of big movies, including the Daniel Craig Bond films as Money Penny. Selena and Mark tell Jim what's what. Good news? No more taxes. Bad news? Fall of man. Killian Murphy sells the hell out of his disorientation from waking up to a world in ruins. What about the government? What are they doing? There's no government. Of course there's a government. There's always a government. Yeah, especially after the Patriot Act. Jim's first plan of action is to run home to his mommy and daddy. The duo agrees to help him, but only if they abide by the two rules of East End Zombieland. One, only travel in numbers. And two, only travel in the sunshine, never by moonlight. So slap that Mexico filter on and let's go find a dead body. Or your parents, Jim. I'm, I'm sure they're fine. When they get to his parents' house the next day, they find the place smelling like British home cooking. No bangers and mash to be found here, though. Just a dead mom and dad. Mark sympathizes with Jim and tells the story of his own family's death. They either died during the evacuation or during a traumatic afternoon in the Chuck E. Cheese ball pit. What you could do is climb climb over more people. They sleep in shifts, and during Jim's watch, he plays a bit of riff tracks with some home movies. Give me a drink of that, will you? 
It's empty. But Jim Jonah raised too loudly and ends up waking the neighbors. Mark and Selena have to remind Mr. Bridges and his daughter how to knock. They put them down by puncturing their stomach lining and just hacking away. Damn, they really get those reps in. Great tricep workout, Mark. The attack is a messy one, and at the end of it, Mark realizes he's got an open wound, open and filling with infected blood. Wait. Selena doesn't wait. Before Mark can hulk out, Selena hulks him to pieces. She wasn't sure if he was infected, but since the rage virus only takes 10 to 20 seconds to transform somebody, she's not taking any chances. So I guess that's rule number three. Don't get infected, or Selena will fuck you up. She tells Jim the next morning that she'll do the same to him. If it happens to you, I'll do it in a heartbeat. She's not here to make friends or find lovers. She's only trying to survive, because she ain't got no time to die. Staying alive's as good as it gets. The frenemies follow a strange North Star, an apartment complex that left its blinker on. Shots like this that show the blackened skyline at night were actually filmed during the day, then darkened during editing. It was easier for the visual effects team to add the Christmas lights, rather than remove all the real lights that would have been on had they shot the skyline at night. Halfway up the Ghostbusters amount of stairs, Jim gets a Pepsi headache and needs to cure it. With more Pepsi. Hair of the dog, I suppose. His SpawnCon R&R is cut short when some infected show up on the ground floor. After seeing the effort it took Jim and Selena, it's terrifying to watch the rage infected bolt up the stairs with ease. Must really suck for Jim, with that belly full of carbonation. A knight in stolen armor guides the survivors to safety and the stragglers to Valhalla, beating them to death. In addition to Doorman, this guy's also the elevator operator, and these days, it only works one way. Once they get past the tiny bouncer, Jim and Selena officially meet the guard Frank and his daughter Hannah, the father-daughter duo single-handedly keeping the spirit of Christmas alive. The gracious hosts toast to new friendship with their finest bottle of Nickelodeon slime. A 94, if I had to guess. Frank is played by Brendan Gleeson, an established actor, unlike most of the cast. By this point, he had already thrown rocks in Braveheart and watched a crocodile eat a bear in Lake Placid. <laughs> most of his earlier roles were often surly, but here, Gleeson brings a lot of heart. He'd combine those traits later as Mad-Eye Moody. After Lights Out, Jim freshens up. Careful, man. Don't cut that razor on your cheekbones. He tells Selena he wants to help Frank and Hannah, since they're good people, but she considers them nothing more than ballast. I'd leave them behind. In a heartbeat. Yeah. Frank knows they're in a rough spot. They've run out of water since it hasn't rained in 10 days. You never think it, needing rain so badly. Not in fucking England. I love this shot of all the empty buckets on the roof, showing how dire things are. At first, the film crew only corralled about a hundred buckets. When Boyle wanted more, they scrounged up a thousand in just a few hours. Probably why some of them are laundry baskets. Without water, their best plan is to follow a sketchy radio broadcast from a military camp. <laughs> Since Frank's past his homicidal prime, and Hannah is still coming into hers, they ask Selena and Jim for their help. After prodding, Selena reluctantly agrees. The foursome sets off in Frank's taxi on a dad joke and a prayer. Just so you know, I don't take checks or credit cards. Too bad they can't play I Spy as they go. It's always the letter M, and the answer is always more kills to count. This travel sequence has an airy, almost whimsical score courtesy of composer John Murphy, whose work helps make this movie something special. The music may not sound like Goblin, but I think it has the same eclectic spirit to it. Like all dads, Frank knows a shortcut that could get his entire family killed. It's an underground tunnel to get across the river, which like, fuck that, I've read that part of the stand. Didn't work out for this guy anyway, whose body is seen down there. But Frank decides to fuck around like Vin Diesel and find out like Mr. Bean. The over-the-hill driving stops the over-the-hill driver when they blow out a tire on the debris. The survivors rally like a NASCAR pit crew and they'd better hurry since they're racing a swarm of rage-crazed chuds who are quickly advancing. I love this movie's use of shadows and lighting to be terrifying. Team Uninfected wins by a hair and the losers go back to loitering aimlessly. It's great seeing these little glimpses into infected behavior when there's no one around to be pissed at. Whole country looking like a corporate mixer. We're in the fun and games portion of the film, one of my favorite tropes in dystopian movies. It's so fun to see fantasies play out of what you would do if you had the world all to yourself. Screenwriter Alex Garland wrote this shopping montage as a direct homage to Dawn of the Dead. Just like with those mismatched survivors, a little consumer roleplay does their souls good. Single malt, 16 year old, tart, full flavor, warmer, 
Low aggressive. Shop smart, shop budgeons. Just past the city limits, the gang pulls over to bully a gas truck. Jim goes inside to see if the roller dogs are still good, but instead, he finds a bunch of corpses, including an infant. Aw oh, man, forget what I said. Zombie apocalypses aren't fun at all. As Jim reflects on the not fun he's having, the world's lightest boy sneaks up on him. <laughs> But the boy ain't sneaky enough to steal home plate. Jim batters up and beats the kid to death all the way! Off screen, that is. Ain't gonna show our hero murdering a child. Before anyone can ask Jim why he looks like he just killed a kid, Hannah distracts them with a sick drift. Yeah, feign disapproval all you want, Frank. What'd you expect when she's dressed like Sonya Blade? The road trip continues down the abandoned M1 motorway. Filming this turned out to be just as difficult as the London scenes. There was like windows where you have like, I don't know, three or four minutes to get the shot. The traffic is held down, down the road. The sequence was shot in its entirety between 7 and 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning, with 10 cameras rolling simultaneously for a whopping minute of footage. Just off screen in these shots is a rolling roadblock guided by the police. The non-Pepsi headaches paid off, though. It really does make the entire country seem desolate, but not too desolate to enjoy life's simplest pleasures. Pretty ponies and picnics with peaches, which come in a can. They were put there by a man in a factory downtown. The storybook setting road stop gets Selena feeling philosophical. You'll never read a book that hasn't already been written. Well, yeah, that's how books work. At least she's softening up a bit. She's given Jim smooches and deciding that she was wrong about being a grumpy poopy pants survivor gal. They finally reach the camp, which is inside a Manchester far from united. That shit's falling apart and on fire. When they enter through the blockade, they don't find salvation. They only find a Call of Duty map. Frank. We have to go. Yeah. Go fucking way up! Poor Frank can't even rage quit beneath an impaled corpse in peace. <coughs> Shut up, bird! I'll report you for griefing. Frank tries to get the bird to stop squawking, but instead just knocks a red-tinted camera lens straight into his eye. Aw, oh, shit. It's a dumb mistake that has lethal consequences, and Frank immediately realizes he done fucked up. In his struggle to fight the rage virus, he sends mixed signals to his daughter. I love you very much. What? Keep away from me. Despite his most valiant fatherly efforts, the virus takes control. Before Jim can make the dad dead, some campers steal his kill. Frank is tragically gunned down right in front of his teenage daughter. Okay guys, he's dead. All right, now you're just wasting ammo, come on. The soldiers take Jim, Selena, and Hannah to their survivor's compound, kicking off the Day of the Dead portion of the film. This impressive Georgian country house is known as Trafalgar Park. It was built in 1733 and isn't near Manchester at all. It's southeast of Salisbury in South Wiltshire. I probably said, all of those words wrong. The man in charge here is Major Henry West, who seems polite enough. Not sure I like how long his soldiers be staring, though. Major West is played by this movie's other known quantity, Christopher Eccleston, a few years before he'd played the Doctor. He'd already been in David Cronenberg's existence, though, as well as Gone in 60 Seconds and Boyle's first film, Shallow Grave. Oh well, yeah, it's a lot of a recurring thing we've done in this sort of ultra violence. As everyone settles in, in their own special ways, West takes Jim aside and offers an apology. Since they're not a full military unit, they're just the leftovers. We must be a disappointment. He doesn't have a cure for the virus, but he does have floodlights, tripwires, landmines, unwanted physical contact, and a massive liability chained up in the garden. And lastly, meet Mela. <laughs> West is keeping Mailer, an infected comrade, alive to learn more about the virus and, you know, keep the third act interesting. Eventually, he'll tell me how long the infected take to starve to death. Hmm, not quite yet. Dinner, anyone? West wants to lead this group's revival of civilization, and judging by how they make Jones the Cook dress, it's not hard to guess what they think of gender roles. Most of these soldiers seem like rowdy rude boys, especially the most bro -y of them all, Corporal Mitchell. Sergeant Farrell's the only sensitive one among them, and he thinks the virus is the universe's way of curing the human disease. Major West doesn't like that kind of talk, but an infected horde interrupts the lovely dinner conversation. It's time for these boys to give them hell and their best stock sound effects. Must be hard to hit these moving targets, because at first, only a few get shooting gallery. Eventually, some dude gets a double kill. Good work, guy. But not to be outdone, one infected goes for a double kill on himself. Ha! Cha! Where are you? He's gone, and getting straight tens from the judges. And hey, you other 13 infected in the wide shots who died off camera, do better. To prepare for their roles, Eccleston and the actors playing his men had a three-day boot camp under a military advisor. I guess they never learned how to keep their eyes and mouths shut for meat shots. 
showers, but the clear is still given, and everyone revels in how safe they are. Except for the women, that is, since Selena is immediately assaulted by Mitch. Jim and Farrell interfere, and a fight threatens to break out until Major West calms everyone down, but doesn't exactly reprimand the meatheads. Slow down. That's because West is a major asshole. He's promised his boys to lure women here as sex toys. Or, sorry, to repopulate society. What do nine men do except wait to die themselves? I don't know, could have tried an improv group or something. This queasy scene is where everything falls apart for our heroes. It was important enough that Murphy, Eccleston, and Garland completely rewrote it on set after they didn't like how the originally scripted version played. It worked. It's grouse! West says Jimmy can join them, but that there's no changing their mind about the women. Er, sorry again, woman and teenaged girl. Jim declines and tries to get the ladies gone, but for those feminist ideals, he ends up knocked out and chained to a radiator, sentenced to execution alongside fellow fellow ally Farrell. Farrell's pretty sure he's got this whole thing figured out. They quarantined us. There is no infection, it's just people killing people. He's insane! Well, there's definitely an infection, but he's actually right about the quarantine part, even though that wasn't always the case. When production started, Boyle and Garland agreed the infection had already spread worldwide. It was only partway through that they decided to rein it back and say the rage virus was confined to Great Britain. Jim and Farrell are marched out to the execution part of the woods. There's a big old pile of anonymous corpses there. Talk about a shallow grave. Corporal Mitchell wants to stick the sergeant to make him suffer, but Private Jones hip fires a favor, putting him down quickly with a gunshot. Mitchell is pissed he didn't get to do a war crime, and during the scuffle, Jim excuses himself and his shirt. He makes it all the way to the unprotected area outside the wall, absolutely ruining their defenses. We're fucked. Now the barbed wire has an ugly shirt stuck in it. Mitch says Jim's as good as dead out there, but he finds enough hope to go Rambo on their asses when he spots proof of civilization. Back at the compound, the monsters play with their victims and dress them up for the night. Selena tries to help Hannah by giving her Valium. If this is gonna happen, at least she can make it so Hannah doesn't care. Thankfully, Jim stops even more war crimes by waltzing up to the blockade and ringing the doorbell. <laughs> The soldiers postpone their plans to nab the prankster, with West and a few others going back to the blockade. What they didn't count on was Jim learning Batman moves in the past half hour. Now Jim can be vengeance. Jim can be the knight. Jim can go all happy Gilmore with a crowbar on Private Davis. And for whatever reason, Jim can set up Davis's body like he's Michael Myers. Okay, Jim. West hits traffic before he can warn the others, so he honks his 50 caliber horn until the road clears. It's the worst, this traffic. Always when you got somewhere to be. I mean, you might as well just get out and Oh, I was joking, that's a terrible idea, but okay, you do you. Back at the base, Jim lets the party off the chain. <sighs> Woo boy, y'all about to get mailer. He's a party animal. Selena tries to comfort Hannah, who's looking like the deflated weed girl. Those pills. I think the ref effect. Hannah's played by Megan Burns in only her second performance ever. After this, she left the business and briefly became a pop star under the name Betty Curse. Though her career didn't wind up like her co-stars, she's still great in this movie. I love her scaring the shit out of the soldiers without even trying. I think they've been killed. Sausage shop! Finally, the party arrives. It's motherfucking Mailer, and y'all know Mailer always at a 10. Ha, there he goes puking again. Now don't call him an Uber, you're doing fine. This place is just getting Mailer. Corporal Mitchell sees that things are falling apart, but still forces the bells back to the ball. Damn, man, you can't be this horny, can ya? Private Bedford here thinks he's got everything under control, but too bad the infected Private Clifton is a clever girl. He ambushes Bedford with Mailer for a two-on-one tickle fight. <laughs> See, Bedford loves getting mailered. Oh, okay, Mailer, maybe tone it down. Private Jones waits until the murder noises stop to crawl out from his super secret hidey hole, but he runs right into a blade in the gut, courtesy of our favorite bike courier. Jim's getting this remorseless killing thing down. I, I think Selena would be proud. Composer John Murphy's kick-ass main theme begins, called In the House in a Heartbeat. It's awesomely ominous, with a nice slow build, as Jim plays hide and seek with the infected. Even the movie starts to blur the line between the man and the rageful. Throughout the film, the rage zombies zoom at an unnatural Natural speed. To achieve this, Boyle and cinematographer Anthony Dodd Mantle shot them at higher frame rates, up to 1600 per second. For this sequence, they shot Jim at the same speed, giving him the same signature jumpiness. In the cursed doll room, somehow Private Bell can tell the difference and calls out for help. Don't fucking leave me! But clinkiness is only gonna attract the wrong people, dude. Like these infected fellers who ring this bell to death. They're for whom the bell tolls. As Hannah hides behind an infected rage dude's self-image issues, Mitchell pulls Selena into a 
a bedroom, still intent on being a heinous douche. Jim sees him from above, and with one last bat move, closes the gap between him and Mitchell. Then he repeatedly closes the gap between Mitchell's skull and the wall. To make sure the Mitch sitch is completely taken care of, Jim sticks his thumb straight into them eyes, giving Mitch deadite LASIK treatment on the house. Selena assumes Jim's been infected, but despite her earlier promise, she hesitates to hack. I was longer than a heartbeat. Oh, I was. That's nice. Uh, damn it, Hannah! You're always ruining moments! You and your drugs! The three flee the house to hail the last cab out of hell, only to find out someone else had the same idea. West shoots Jim in the happy trail, so Hannah peels out to avenge his abs. Now, I don't agree with it, but she makes a great case for driving high. Her drifts have never been cleaner. Maller hears his door dasher coming in hot. Good thing, this party was just starting to die down. And you know Maller likes to keep it going all night! West dies a poetic death hoisted by his own petard, or ripped to shreds by the rage-infected co-worker he kept on a chain in the backyard. Yep, same day. The survivors leave and yada yada their way to safety with another title card. Wow, didn't know title cards had a BOGO going on. Thanks to Selena's MacGyver surgery, Jim has survived his second near-fatal car crash within like three days of waking up from the last one. At least now he gets to recover in 35 millimeter film instead of on digital video. Since another four weeks have passed, the infected are finally dying of starvation. Like these two. Ha! Almost made it to the end credits, dudes. With the global quarantine having done its job, international forces are now checking in on any surviving Brits. That includes Jim, Selena, and Hannah, who have been shacked up in a cozy cottage. They flag down the pilot with the world's largest handkerchief trick, and the movie ends on an optimistic note for our heroes. How many dead body icons have infected the blank white void of the numbers? Let's find out it... Wait, what is that? <laughs> Sorry, I just hate when stuff gets in my eye. By our count, there were 178 dead people in 28 days later. Of those, 43 were men, 13 were women, and 122 were too blurry to tell, giving us a pie chart as gray as the skies over London. This respectable amount of kills puts 28 Days Later as the seventh highest kill count on this show. Welcome to the top 10, my British bros! With a runtime of 113 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 0.63 minutes, or 38 seconds. Man, those mass graves really sneak up on you. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the double landmine dude. You don't get too many landmine kills in horror movies in the first place, and this guy goes and double dips? Respect. Double machete for lamest kill goes to Private Bedford. Plenty of people got killed off screen, but this is via neck snap sound effect. Show us some bone, Boyle! And that's it. 28 Days Later came out in 2002 and ushered in a new breed of speedy zombies. Its phenomenal success led to a 2007 sequel 28 weeks later. I'll look at that when I can, but right now I've got some stuff going on, sorry. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Cow. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Cow. Just a reminder that on Sunday is the second annual Dead Meat Horror Awards. It's premiering live here on Dead Meat at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. Make sure you don't miss it. This year's a lot bigger than last year. We actually put a budget towards this thing. Check out the nominees slash finalists on our YouTube community posts, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. I think they're all, they're all posted on all of them. I want to thank some patrons like Daniel West, Tony, William, Darth Joker, Taco from TV, Jake Parker 24, Brady 54, Patrick Young, Brady Cook, and William Franklin. Thanks everyone, be good people. Almost. <laughs>